So when I had the idea of PyCaret, I actually didn't knew Python. I did R for a couple of months, but I had no background in programming whatsoever. So that means thinking, if you have an idea or you know why you want to do, I think for beginning, you don't have to care how you would do because you would eventually figure out a way to do it. Mois, welcome to the CLL podcast. Congratulations on launching PyCaret 2.0. We'll talk more on PyCaret 2.0, but first let's look at your journey till the inception of PyCaret. You did your master's in economics from University of Karachi and then chartered management accountant from CIMA. You worked in East Africa in healthcare analytics and then moved to Canada. You became a chartered professional accountant. You worked in analytics at SickKids and Scodia Bank and are currently heading Center of Analytics at PwC Canada. And then while you are in this role, you founded PyCaret. How has your journey been so far till this entire part of it, Mois? Thank you, Kunal. Thank you. I'm extremely thrilled to be here. The journey was uh, exciting. I have always been in reporting and analytics role uh, ever since I started my career in 2008. And I think 10 years ago, probably, That's when all the business process automation and process automation start to happen. And I was very early in my career, I realized that the things that we have been doing, especially in any department that deals with reporting, any department that deals with reporting and has data, I think I realized way back uh, in, in the start of my career that things would change because the way process automation is affecting especially the operational tasks. So if you think accounting, uh, there could be nothing more repetitive than accounting, right? So I think that's what got my interest. I was uh, by profession, I'm a charter accountant and I practiced it for a few years. Prior to that, my background, so my college is is, is in medicine. So my background is in medicine. So so I, I didn't have a formal computer science education per se. But I was always influenced by the way technology can change things. So I was very curious. I was always a very good reader. I would keep an eye on what's going on, what's not doing. And when I moved from Africa to Canada four years ago, I I saw an opportunity to revamp my career. And that's where I have chosen this, my second master's degree from Queen's University last year. And as I was uh, going through the program, <clears throat> that's where the Pike, Pike Carrot idea started. And last uh, one and a half year was extremely crazy because Pike Carrot is like a full-time thing to me, except that it's not a paid job. It's an open source thing. So it takes a lot of time still because we are still a growing community and I am investing a lot of time in creating a team, which is truly diverse, which has its, which has uh, balanced strengths, both in terms of software engineering and data science and the team has the vision. So I think I'm investing a lot of time these days to create that team who would basically help PyCaret integrate more in community. Because at the end of the day, if community uh, would not pick up this project, it, it would die just like any other open source project. The only difference between good project and great open source projects is community. So I think uh, it, it was an excellent journey. And uh, if you ask me whether I would repeat that, I think I would say yes without any hesitation. Thanks for letting us know your journey. And hey, for the podcast listeners here, we wanted to also thank Chayan for putting all of this content and research for us so that we could design the flow of the podcast. So Moise, you're currently working as the head of Center of Excellence as PwC. What are some of the challenges you face while working on this current role. Can you let us know about some of the top challenges? Sure. So I think it's not just specific to PwC, but because I do a lot of um, consulting and academy research as well. So I think at the end of the day, what it boils down to is uh, I think the lack of, I, I don't know if this is the right word, but I'll still say it. I think it's the lack of clarity from people I think the expectations from business of what analytics, advanced analytics and data science can solve, I think it's still a myth in some part because I think that clarification is not there. So the expectations are not real. I think that's the biggest challenge. The gap between 
technology teams and teams who have business requirements, that gap is, I think, in my view, it's, it's, the, it's the most problematic thing in, in today's analytics space. I agree with you, Moise, on this. I was in a client interaction sometime back, maybe let's like, say two, three years back. And like the way you said the gap between technology and how analytics or machine learning space looks like, it was huge. Like they came up with a simple statement. Can you give us this particular answer by doing machine learning? And they didn't have any background data or any supporting data to even give us to even get to that answer. So that was a big eye opener for me also. Yeah. And I, I also think the, I think it's, it's really good that AI and data science and all these uh, fancy terms are getting a lot of attention in the last three, four years, especially when we have seen few practical applications of uh, deep learning. So it's really getting that buzz around it, but not everything in this world can be solved by machine learning and deep learning. The problem is just because it's too cool, everybody thinks that deep learning is ultimate alternate to everything else. It's, it's an alternate to your business acumen. It's an alternate, or I would say it would substitute your business knowledge. It would, it's a better version of machine learning. It's, it's, it doesn't require you to have a statistical knowledge. It doesn't require you to have common sense. All this is not true. It's not, it's very good that we have advanced so much into data science and all these cool things going on these days, GPT-3 and all. I think mm-hmm. it's really cool, but it's not replacement for anything and everything in the world. So I think that, especially when I see that kind of confusion in young data scientists or students, I think that's where we need to control that. That's where we need to advocate and educate people that deep learning is not a better version of machine learning. It's not a better, it's not a substitute of statistics, classical statistics. It's a great technique, but it has, you have to have certain, like you have to meet certain requirements in order to get a value out of it. You cannot absolutely apply RN and CNN on Titanic error. So I think uh, we need to, I think we, we all need to, as a community, need to play a role there to educate young data scientists and students, because at the end of the day, like 10 years or 20 years from today, the talent pipeline that we have, I think they, they are the one who will shape the future of deep learning or machine learning 10 years from today. Uh, so it's very important. You brought up uh, a very interesting point, Moise. A lot of focus is there on AI, machine learning, and all of the cool jargons that you mentioned. But again, do you think in colleges, the focus for domain understanding or like thinking about a business problem and trying to bring out relevant solutions without involving MN or AI per se, but do you think that gap in what universities are teaching or what students are learning, is there a gap between what's happening there? Yeah, absolutely. I think the the way data science is being taught, it's very, without offending anybody, I think it's very unfortunate because if we go and Google now, I think 80% of the courses are actually teaching you Python instead of data science. So the moment cool things happening, your Mm -hmm. focus as a student shifts entirely from when to use lasso and bridge regression to dot fit and dot predict because obviously it's you see the results right in front of you so i think with the with the data science education uh, you rightly pointed out that problem prevail i think what they should actually be teaching in a typical data science course they should first have a prerequisite for python and r and everything else uh, I, and i think it is absolutely important to be savvy and know these languages uh, you don't have to be a proper software engineer, but at least know that. But I think these should be prerequisites of uh, prerequisites of data science course. They should not be part of data science course. What, what we should actually do in data science education, if it's management related, we should basically train people to frame business problem into a machine learning problem, because that's the hardest part. Even in your real life uh, use case, the hardest part is business would come to you or client would come to you they would tell their problem. Nobody would actually tell you that we need this kind of architect neural network. So I think the biggest focus we, sh- we should have is on how to take a problem 
and convert it into or frame it into a machine learning problem and then use machine learning or deep learning or whatever you can to solve that problem. For example, if your client has a problem of inventory management, it is your primary responsibility as a data scientist to actually help him make that problem statement a little more ambiguous or clarify it, or simplify it. And then also it is your responsibility to frame that inventory management problem by converting into some kind of forecasting problem that would actually help to, to manage inventory and you'd have less uh, outages. I think that's the primary role of data science. But unfortunately, I think uh, the entire focus is on the on something which is in my in my view is just five or ten percent of the entire process. Agree with you, Moise. So we have this 80 per, 80 20 per rule. So 80 percent of the courses are like ML, AI, Python based, whereas it should be like business thinking, framing your business problem statements, thinking about what the client has said and converting them into a problem statement and doing and also one more important part is like doing the data prep. Some of the times uh, doing the data prep, some of the times we prepare a data, we want to do cluster analysis and see customer segmentation. But again, your data is not too supportive to give you good clusters also. So again, how do you revamp or remodel the data to look or give you the performance that you need to give? Do you have a full-time job you write, consult? and are working on democratizing machine learning for data scientists. How much of your time is devoted to creating PyCarrot? I would say when I started this, it was more like a full-time job. I used to work 18, 20 hours sometimes in a day, especially during last summer. But these days, after the second release of PyCarrot, I obviously have a good support from community. So as we are talking now, there are developers already working on the code and I have I think uh, it, it maybe in few weeks we would pike at it as a public organization. So I'm hoping to have uh, more community and more developers to contribute. So with that, my time obviously would be very limited to vision and leadership. But the way I managed it for last year is basically by working access hours. There is no substitute of, of hard work. Uh, you have to put in that hours and you have to put in that work to create something like this. It's It's impossible to create something like this in a seven, seven hour work day. So uh, obviously with all of the time that you have spent and since you are also not from the tech background, like many of many, many are fortunate to come from like coding comes naturally to a lot of them. You didn't have that background. And so did that add to the extra effort, like reading a lot, like you mentioned, and then doing things and revisiting things and rewriting stuff? Did that happen to you during that period? Yeah, so not many people know this, uh, and I'm not shy to share this now. But when I actually started thinking, so when I had the idea of PyCarrot, I actually didn't knew Python. I did R for a couple of months, but I had no background in programming whatsoever. So that means that thinking, if you have an idea uh, or why you want to do, I think for beginning, you don't have to care how you would do because you would eventually figure out a way to do it. If you have a wonderful idea and you are convinced and you, you have slept over that idea and you are still excited and passionate about that idea, I think it's absolutely important that you do not ask how I will do it because you would that that should not demotivate you so the first thing is i obviously had no computer uh, programming background so when i started building pycarrot i was actually building pycarrot in jupyter node and when we released 1.0 version we didn't had unit tests we didn't have so many other ci cd kind of things travis builds blah 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 all that i have learned as throughout my journey you don't have to be perfect on day one. So that's the idea. So when I started, I obviously had to do a lot of rework, a lot of Google, a lot of stack workflow. But for me, that was a journey, right? So I would encourage anybody who, you not knowing coding should not be a barrier in any case. And one most important thing that I keep saying to people is you should, even if you don't want to learn coding, even if you don't want to practically do it, 
I think you should learn how to think coding. Writing is not a big deal. So I'm not a software engineer. So after 2.0 release, what's happening is I have a lot of people coming in who are hardcore software engineers and they are improving the code base without affecting the functionality of products. Users of PyGarret wouldn't know, but behind the scene, uh, we have software engineers working on it, improving code day by day. So I think the, the point being is uh, it's absolutely important that you can think coding. Writing, I think if you have great management skills, good leadership skills, you can manage that outsourcing pr process. But thinking code is extremely important because I think coding is a communication skill, right? Coding is basically a way to communicate with machines. And in today's world, we say communication skills are really important, but it's not just your communication skill with other human beings because communicating with computer is also a communication skill. It's a language in itself, right? So I think it's everybody, irrespective of which field you are in, you should be able to at least think think coding because that would help you think logically and that would build your problem solving skills because at the end of that day, that's what coding is it's a problem solving skill absolutely if you want to communicate the more detailed or the more specific you are with a you know machine then exactly what they will follow yeah just like in real life i mean yep so obviously for the audience that are listening to us that Moise has worked on this particular problem statement even without knowing Python. And hence, I wanted to bring the focus to how important it is to basically have a vision in mind and, and then work towards solving it versus trying to accumulate things or try to learn so many things before even you want to apply stuff. So it's basically have a, have a business problem in mind that you want to solve and then work towards what what's required to uh, solve that particular problem statement. And also another thing was uh, called out here is that, hey, while he was building that, the product PyCarrot, Pi, Pi there was a requirement later in the stage to come up with unit testing. And, and that's where we are stepping into software engineering part. So for those people who are learning only machine learning and AI and all of that, at some point of time, if you are creating something big, you also will need to be testing your code rigorously before it goes into production. And that's some of the skills you also need to pick up while you're doing machine learning or data science. Absolutely. Now, Kunal, I, just to add, I think that's a very good point you mentioned, Kunal. I just to add that what I think data science is a glorified software engineering problem to eventually be able to do data science, not as a citizen data scientist, not a marketing analytics data scientist, not a sales data scientist, not a financial data scientist, not those roles. But if you really want to be, for example, in companies where you would be part of centralized data science teams who are responsible for managing infrastructure and setup, you have to learn software engineering. It's, it's a glorified, software engineering problem at a scale. There is no way you would be able to make it big without software engineering skills. So that's, if, if you are targeting roles in, in centralized data science. Skills. Agreed, Moise. So Moise, uh, this is the first time I'm talking to somebody who actually created a Python package and I've always been fascinated with creation of Python packages. We'll speak about creation of PyCarrot later, but first I wanted to know what was your marketing strategy to take a finished version to market? Interesting. So this is a good question because every time anybody asks me about it, my answer is you PyCarrot as a package because people use it as a Python package. For me, it's a product where package is only 10% of it. To be honest, even in terms of efforts, 10% is a little bit undervalued, but I would say I would say there is a lot of work that goes behind and that's not just part of the package that was part of the product. So for example, all the content that goes online, the website itself, all the images, artifacts, videos, and everything else, I think it's a lot of work and it has nothing to do with code. So I think as I went over time in this last one year, I, I didn't only have learned Python and develop PyCarrot, but I also had to adopt WordPress, Joomla, and three, four other things to build the website. So I had to learn all these things. And then finally, when we were releasing it, 
I did a soft release, I think somewhere in January, early 1.0 kind of announcement and got probably uh, 100 views or 200 views on LinkedIn. And, and then I realized uh, it, there are millions of projects and this project would be just like other projects if we don't uh, put the word out. So to me, at the end of the day, it comes down to how well can we put the word out on LinkedIn, Twitter, social media, stuff like that. So I think we, 70% of my hard work went into strategizing social media and coming up with the content and coming up with strategy and distribution and all that. Absolutely. So not only did you learn how to code and bring it all together, the product together, but also the aspect that nobody wants to create the images or think about the icons or think about how, what's going to be, how the website is going to look like and all of yeah, that. Yeah. Thing. And if, we, if you see our website and content, it's not by coincidence. It's a very thoughtful, very intentional design. Our content is being uh, written and proofreaded by three or four uh, students and data scientists so that it's a beginner friendly content. So I think now there is a team as well that put a lot of uh, hard work. So. Absolutely. Now at CLL, we are also working on the similar pace. So we feel you on terms of the marketing strategy, at least we are like creating images, short videos and promotionals, and then getting into medium. So all of that work is like overwhelming at some time, but again, at, at some point it is also an enjoyable process because we we'll, we love putting good content out. Yeah. Another thing uh, I wanted to ask on this Moes is that obviously PyCarrot came out of some inspiration, but did you see, did you measure a product market fit for the opens for the open source products PyCarrot? No, I, I, I didn't compare or I didn't do any formal need analysis or gap analysis because it actually, as I mentioned, it actually started in Jupyter Notebook. So when I was building it, I had no idea that one year later we would be using PyCarrot on GPUs and we are now doing so much cool engineering and stuff. So I had no idea back then. If I had a little bit idea, I would obviously do some kind of need analysis, but over time, I think with 2.0 release, I think PyCarrot has taken its own position. So people tend to compare it with scikit-learn and other libraries, but I don't think so because PyCarrot is not an algorithmic library. We, we don't have algorithms and we don't intend to include our own algorithms. So we, we don't have any research behind it. But I see PyCarrot as a replacement for the code that you would write if you were to directly work with uh, scikit-learn, XGBoost, like GPM. So I think PyCarrot has its own unique position. That's very coincidentally, I would be very honest. When we started building it, I never thought that PyCarrot would replace boilerplate codes. Probably one year ago, I even didn't knew what is boilerplate. So I think it's, it has its own space in open source. Uh, so you're saying it, uh, it, it doesn't compare well with the ML frameworks in scikit-learn or let's say H2O or Teapot, uh, all of these things. But there's some part of automation going on behind. Does that part of automation compare to the existing auto ML frameworks that we have like H2O or Teapot or AWS so, Autopilot? So I never created PyCarrot uh, with the intention for a complete autopilot. In, in Before the 1.0 release, we had an auto ML, which was pretty similar to H2O and Dell Robot, which, which, which is basically you have a library of models and you would basically based on some kind of space optimization, you would iterate over your library and create different models, right? That's what AutoML is. Some, I think Google is the exception as it's using reinforcement learning to define the search space. But I think with all the other tools out there, open source, paid, non-paid, the initial search space is still randomly defined. It's not using transfer learning or genetic. But, but with PyCarrot, I never aim to create AutoML because there are already enough AutoMLs and I think H2O framework is also pretty solid. I created PyCarrot for, for in-person modeling experience. So you're sitting in front of computer, you are coding and your aim is to train a classifier that you can use to predict on new data sets. It could be in production, it could be your school, it could be research, it could be academy. And as you are doing the, the, the amount of code you write, or the amount of boiler code that you have to maintain it because 90% of students 
uh, if they're not coming from a computer science or quantitative background, they would basically have a R file or a Python file somewhere where they would have this, this code that they would copy from here and there. So my idea was to basically replace that because being a student myself, what I realized is people spend way too much time in deciding cross-validation, in deciding split, in deciding metrics, in deciding this and that. I think it's, I think we should spend some time, but I don't think so 90% of our time should be spent on just coding it so that you can get one number out at the end of your experiment. So I actually wanted to replace the process for those academicians, students, researchers, and data scientists. So uh, replace the kind of coding, replace the, or get rid of the need to write uh, 10 lines or 20 lines of code just to achieve, achieve a simple thing. And uh, with, with time, I realized, although we should not do it, but if you read PyCaret code, like it's literally like English language. I think I would say we, we, we should always put comments in our code, but I think with PyCaret, especially when I put comments, I don't think so my comments make sense because literally we are writing create model and the comment of that line is creating a model. So, so comment doesn't add any value because the, the function themselves are very intuitive and easy. So I never wanted to be in the space of uh, developing world-class auto ML solution because I'm not a huge uh, believer of machines replacing everything. I, I don't think so. Auto ML is, don't get me wrong. I think so. Auto ML is really good, but I don't think so. It's, I think so. It's overhyped. It's simply asking machine to perform something under loop. That's, that's what it is. And when it comes to decision about whether we can use an AutoML framework in production, I, I don't think so. A lot of people will be comfortable with that uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and the problem is, the problem is uh, AutoML frameworks, uh, which, are, which are selling themselves as, as software as a service. So for example, that are robot. They are, they are good and I consider them good because it's not just the training part because training obviously under the hood, there is nothing proprietary in data science, right? There is, nobody has this one algorithm that outperforms everybody. Nobody has it. There is no algorithm like that. Everybody is using the same collection of algorithms. So there is nothing proper. But I think uh, companies like Datarobot, they have very strong ML ops. So if your citizen data scientist would use Datarobot to train the models, they would also maintain the entire life cycle of model inside that robot. So it's a very strong software in a sense that you would have a complete end-to-end -end ML cycle. You can do uh, monitor data drift and stuff like that for future. So I think it, with that sense, it's a, it's a good software, but I think it's very expensive. So in order for you to afford for that, obviously you cannot buy a personal license for that robot. There's no such thing as a $25 or $100 license per month. You have to be a company and then it's a very expensive license. So if you do not have dozens and dozens of use cases in your back pocket, it's not financially viable decision to buy an auto ML software because it's very expensive. Machine learning platforms as a service. So for example, Azure has its own machine learning auto ML service. Google has a auto ML service. It's called Google Tables. Uh, and I think AWS also SageMaker, I think SageMaker Studio has an auto ML component to it. I think everybody does. And those are the subscriptions you can use even as an individual, because uh, obviously uh, you, first of all, you get a credit, a good amount of credit when you sign up. So if you want to learn, you can learn it. I have used a, a lot of auto ML solutions, especially during, during my school, because what I did was uh, I focused on learning data science concepts rather than investing a lot of time in troubleshooting my code when I was in school. And then I later catched up with code at, at my own. So that's the strategy I use. But I think AutoML softwares, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be a replacement for most of the companies. I don't think so it would replace production level data science teams. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, I mean, you mentioned how uh, you wrote this low code so that how you wrote PyCaret so that it basically can help a lot of people think versus fumble about what exactly. strategy cross validation and all of that is happening. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if, if, when I was, when I was in a school, like, and this is, I'm pretty sure this is normal with everybody. 
like 70%, 60% of the time, 50% of the time at least, people would discuss this code is failing, that code is failing, this is happening, that is happening. The problem with the open source frameworks are in Python, it's never same. You send me your code, if I don't have an environment, it, it can fail, right? It, so that's the biggest problem. And your day one doesn't start on Docker, that's the problem. It starts on your local PC and then your code keep failing and 50, 60% of the time, you just invest in troubleshooting this which you would actually not do in real life because if you really don't know how to troubleshoot your code, one, either you would never become a product, you would never be a data scientist or a software engineer because if you don't know, you don't know. Two, you are wasting your 50% of valuable time in something which you would not care about in future because if you don't want to become a software engineer, you would be a citizen data scientist. There would always be a team of engineering who would do this code, right? In production environment, if you are a dead beginner, nobody would even let you touch the systems. So you would never be doing this coding stuff if you can't do it today and if you don't want to learn. So I think your time, 50, 60% of time, it's well spent in thinking about more creative ideas on how to solve this problem rather than thinking about should we now train support vector machine. So that's, that's, what, that's, that's why I, that's the original reason I created Pi. Uh, absolutely agree. So now obviously you moved from Pi Carrot 1.0 to 2.0 and then the whole idea behind this is that you keep improving the way we look at data science in terms of simplicity. So what are the significant features that you introduced in PyCarrot 2.0 and uh, what are the things, what are the features that are there in pipeline that you want to further add? Okay. So I think the biggest change for me from 1.0 to 2.0 was when I released 1.0, we had... Uh, a lot of people logging issues in first few days after the release. And the issues are mostly around cannot some kind of error. Uh, and that error was based on the fact that I actually never took into account that people would use PyCarrot in, in command line, in SageMaker. People would use it in different environments. At that time, I thought it's Jupyter Notebook only. But after releasing 1.0, I realized target audience is much more uh, broader and bigger than just a student. So in 2.0, the first biggest thing we did is we make it compatible with command line. So we, we are using HTML heavily and that is causing a failure in 1.0 when you use it outside of Jupyter Notebook because of that interactive display groups. So in 2.0, we made it compatible with command line. So you can pass a parameter when you initialize the setup and you can use it in terminal, you can use it in a spider or whatever environment. So that's that. I think that has just increased the uh, market size for us, uh, the number of users for us. The second biggest thing in 2.0 is uh, the integration with MLflow. So MLflow is a is an open source Python library. Uh, it's actually it's not just Python; it's in R and other languages as well. But it's created by a team at Databricks, and it has a natural integration. If you are using Databricks, it gives you end-to-end -end ability of not just training model, but also basically maintaining the life cycle of the model. So we integrated or adopted to the back end of MLflow. So now you can actually use PyCarrot not just to train your models, but also to store the artifacts and manage the deployment, which I think which makes it more accessible and which makes it, which makes PyCarrot more practical, right? Because now you would not only train your model, but you would also maintain it and the reason and again this was always part of the plan it was left out in 1.0 because we wanted to uh, see test the market and see how's the exposure but it was always the plan because i have seen people managing notebooks like final one final two nine final three. and uh, and then imagine uh, if you're using jupyter notebook to train your models i absolutely have no idea today how is this world Everybody in this world, how, how, how are we keeping track of it? Because if in one Jupyter notebook, you have tried 30 different things and trained 10 different models. Now you have not just the models, but the entire pipeline that you have to pickleize and not just that, but you generate a lot of metadata. That's a little bit different than software engineering in a sense that in software engineering, your goal is clear from point A to go point B you exactly know what needs to be done. In data science, there is a reason it's called experiment because you, you don't, there is no clear path from going to 
from going A to B. There is no objective that you have to go to point B, but there's no clear path. So there is a there, there is an experiment process in, in middle, right? And because of that, you generate a lot of metadata. If you train 50 models, you train, I, I don't know, maybe thousands of data points in terms of metadata. So all the models has hyperparameters and not just the model, all the pre-processing pipeline that you have used to train the model, all of them has hyperparameters and the metrics that you generate, accuracy, AUC, blah, 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 all those by 10 fold or 20 fold or whatever number of folds, all those data points, how do you, one way is you run it in a notebook, copy the number, paste it in Excel and maintain a table. That would be, you can do that for five models, but that would be a very stupid idea if you're, if you're regularly doing it. So I, I, so I think that for, for me, that's really, that's a game changer because I'm not just the creator of that, but I use that at my work and I know a couple of uh, companies using it already and it's a wonderful feature. Absolutely. I've also tried integrating PyCarrot with Power BI and the process was seamless, uh, Moise. The way it was done, the simplicity at which I wrote the codes and then just ran it and it worked all together. Did you like think about integrating PyCarrot and Power BI initially or like it came up because of the use cases that you're dealing with uh, at, at some of the roles that you're working with? Uh, no, I think even when we released 1.0, we had these integrations in our mind. We know it was working with Alteryx, uh, Nine, Power BI, uh, ClickSense, uh, and a few other tools like that. But the fact that I was always focused on a group which is not coming from a computer science background, that means I was targeting uh, citizen data scientists, analysts, and I know visualization is one big part of job even if you're a citizen data scientist. And I myself uh, being a very active um, community member of uh, Power BI. So I think to me it came naturally, but it was intentional. It was intentional uh, from the beginning. We just Absolutely. created a lot of content around it to promote the use. I don't think so. Before PyCarrot, if you would go to YouTube and search machine learning in Power BI, you would see one or two videos maybe, but I don't think so. It was a very popular idea before PyCarrot. Absolutely. We'd, we'd love to see some of these use cases come on very easily, like especially when we are trying to do cluster analysis and showing how clusters are moving in for different uh, customers. That will be a very good use case because the way the, the place where I work, Dell marketing team, we analyze customers and we do targeting a lot. So having the custom uh, clusters put in place and should be easily uh, distributable so that everybody can look at it and then take necessary targeting decisions on, on that cluster analysis. So that for me was a very exciting use case that we could give a shot. Yeah. Okay. Here's another uh, question on that many data scientists that are currently not working in PyCarrot. What is it in them? Uh, what is it? Uh, why would they move? from their comfort zone to a pie carrot. So I'm talking basics, basically not exactly moving from what they're existing using, but how do you see that current data scientists, they augment their entire journey of data science with pie carrot. So how do you see that unfolding? Well, I don't think so. It has to replace anything of what you're currently doing. It's just one more tool in your toolbox. So I think take it that way. It would save your time. It, it would save you a lot of time. And uh, I think it wouldn't be about who can build the models or who can do this thing. I think in future, it would be more about who can do this efficiently. Because uh, I'm sure companies would care that you don't take one month to train one model. So I think it would save you time. There's nothing to lose. There's absolutely no learning curve. Uh, under the hood, it's scikit-learn, it's XGBoost, it's light GBM, it's scat boost. It's, uh, it's everything same that you have seen. And the way PyCare is, it's developed based on a functional programming pattern. So it's, it's functionally type. But the way it's developed, it's a hybrid for us because the, the objects or the models that you get out of PyCarrot is actually a psychic learn object or a light GBM object or a head boost object. And you can, you, and those are basically SKLearn or light GBM classes and you can interact them 
in the same way you would do if you're working with Scikit. What it saves you to do is every time when you start through your training process, PyCallet would save you time so that you don't have to set up your cross validation strategy every time. You don't have to, you don't have to calculate metrics and log them. You don't have to write 10 lines of extra code to create a pandas data frame to present the results. You don't have to 20 lines of code every time to do a AUC plot or confusion metrics plot. You don't have to write 15 lines of code to ship your model to AWS S3 or GCP or Azure blob storage. You don't have, you don't have to write five lines of code uh, when you're doing um, some kind of diagnostics on your model. So I think uh, there's nothing new. There is no learning curve, uh, or I would say very minimum learning curve. So there is nothing to lose. For data scientists, I think if you would make an effort to adopt to it, you would realize that it's very intentional. We have created in a way that you can use this in your existing ecosystem, even to a point where if you don't have anything else and if there is a need and you have to do it, you can literally take PyCaret and write PyCaret code in your SQL server, like literally. And it's not a big deal because if you have mm -hmm. seen PyCaret's code before, it's actually not, I, I wouldn't even call X lines of code because you are not even writing complete lines. You are literally writing create tune on sample. So they are not even just lines, they're just words. So mm -hmm. I think um, that the, there is no loss. I think people not using it, thinking it would do any harm. I think that's a very stupid idea. Yes. So basically uh, it augments uh, data scientists and it helps them improve sp speed and all of that there. And also as an uh, educator, I teach data science. I, I think beginning with PyCare, it will be very simple when we are teaching they get the entire concept and then they can yeah. you know pick up a lot of other things moving forward and you know customize if they have to but with pycrate it will be very simple as okay we are going to do this we're going to tune models it'll be one one or two lines of code and then they see that entire process working in front of their eyes exactly i think it's more important me myself being involved in teaching i think it's very important that i teach my students What's the difference between how is model constructed differently in, uh, if you're doing a support vector machine versus a decision tree model uh, instead of uh, helping them import untrained classes from Scikit, right? Because that's not what I want to teach. It, there's nothing wrong with it, but if, if it was a Python class, I would be happy to teach that. But I think in machine learning, it should be used in academic environment because especially it would allow, it would, you realize that it would allow professors and teachers to kind of restructure or reallocate their time into in, in, in different areas instead of helping troubleshoot the code. PyCarrot is open source, as you mentioned. How do you sustain PyCarrot financially? Do you have a plan to bootstrap or get some funding for PyCarrot? So far, everything that I have self-funded, I haven't asked for funding from anybody, neither did anybody has shown interest in, in funding it. So far, everything is self-funded, including website, domains, licenses, registrations, videos, and everything else. But I think going forward, we have a few routes where we would go, especially after 2.0 release. We have a few tech players reaching out to us, and I think we would have good prospects in getting a support from, from these big companies in terms of not, not just in money, but also in terms of developer support. So normally, they would contribute in terms of they would allocate a student FD to you or probably part-time developers on, on the project to keep it going. So with this Moise, we want to do something fun with you. This is something we call as a rapid fire round. <laughs> so let's start the rapid fire round for this particular podcast. Here's the first question. Name three people who have been your influencers in your journey for creating PyCarrot. I would say Professor Anton teaches predictive modeling. I used to watch a lot of videos of Andrew NG and, and then I would also say Geoffrey Hinton. What's more important in data science, understanding the concepts or getting the implementation done? Both. What's the worst advice you have ever gotten in your life? Many people told me PyCarrot should be a paid tool. I think that's the worst advice. PyCarrot is so cool. If you had to give a tagline to PyCarrot, what would it be? It's simple. <laughs> what other packages do you like other than PyCarrot? I think I love almost all open source packages, but these days I'm a huge fan of uh, PyTorch. 
So with this, we come to uh, the end of the rapid fire round and we'll just take a few other questions. Uh, we are almost at the end of the show. So uh, I'm very curious to know why the name Pi Carrot? Yeah, I, I should have actually mentioned that. So when I was in the school, I was very impressed uh, by the work of Dr. Max Kuhn, who built the package called Carrot in R and Carrot stands for classification and regression training. That's what Carrot stands for. And Pi is obviously a representation of Python. Because when we started this, I, I didn't have uh, an idea that we would expand to unsupervised and NLP and all that. That's why it's Carrot is just a representation of classification and regression training, obviously uh, in, influenced by Dr. Max Kuhn's work in, in R. Absolutely. And Carrot, obviously, I've been an R user myself, and then I was using Carrot there. And I was thinking that in my mind, oh, okay, I think so. That should have inspired Pi Carrot somewhere. Okay. Yeah. We want to also know as a CLL community, how we can contribute to PyCarrot and what are the ways that you think uh, will help in terms of improving PyCarrot and what kind of contribu contributions you're looking forward to? Absolutely. So until the first, like PyCarrot 1.0, obviously there, is a, there was a page of contribution on our website, but I had no idea of uh, what to do with people reaching out for contribution. We were not that mature on GitHub. We were not that organized. But now as we speak today, most of the things are streamlined. So if, if you are into coding and you are looking to contribute, go to our GitHub. There are open issues uh, and there are help wanted tags everywhere. And uh, things that are urgent, I also pin them. Things that on the top of our GitHub are my personal messages. It's, like a request or a call for help from experts. So if you are into technical things, we need you very much in order to grow in future. I think you should see our GitHub start contributing on open issues. There is an active sprint going on for next 2.1 release, which is going to be at the end of this month. So there is an active sprint, contribute your code, contribute improvements, and there would be major, major refactoring projects uh, that would go, that would go on and I'm already forming a team for that so feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you, if you are really experienced seasoned software engineer and you can give your time I think you should and if you are not software engineer you can still contribute a lot by contributing in documentation you can help us improve documentation you can help us develop content and I think I consider content as a very big part of my career so if you're not into coding, but you can write, and I think reach out to me, uh, that's a very important area to contribute as well. Awesome. So the audience that is listening here, you, you heard him. Basically, there's a lot of things that you can do, documentations and uh, all of that. And if you're like non-tech, documentation is one of the things that you can pick up. If you're technology, all the things that uh, Mois mentioned. And the other part is, obviously, there's a lot of use cases that uh, can be done with PyCarrot that can help the community know how to use PyCarrot as, as a product. So if you have those use cases, please have them uh, coming. Thanks, Kunal, for having me here. It was, a, it was a pleasure and fun to be here tonight. And to all the listeners, make sure you subscribe to Co-Learning Launch YouTube channel as well as PyCarrot's YouTube channel. Co-Learning Launch, they're, they're doing fantastic work building tech communities. Thank you. And we just wanted to call out Chayan's effort and Yukesh's effort for putting all of this together. 